Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking about the alphabet. Woohoo! Actually, we're talking about lots of alphabets. Even better. And things that aren't even alphabets. Ooh. <laughs> We're going to do an interview. And before we get to introducing our guest, I just want to say that this is the beginning officially of our eighth season. Wow. Yeah. We've slowed down to about one a month now. We were doing two a month when we started. But still, that's a lot of episodes. This is episode number 109. And we're on our eighth season. I feel like we've been doing this a while. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not that that makes any particular difference to anyone. It's just a way of counting the passage of time. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're going to be talking with Tim Brooks. Tim Brooks has an MA from Oxford University. He founded the Endangered Alphabets Project in 2009 and is the author of Endangered Alphabets and the Atlas of Endangered Alphabets. He is recognized as the world's leading figure in script endangerment and revitalization. Tim currently lives in Vermont, and among his other work is a woodcarver who produces beautiful sculptural representations of scripts and alphabets from around the world. You'll hear lots more about that in the interview, but I strongly urge you to go to his website if only to see some of the lovely things he's made. We spoke to Tim back at the beginning of the summer, so let's hear that now. So hi Tim, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me. Well, I think what we want to maybe start off with today is a question that we ask many of our guests about the unexpected connections that maybe got you into what you're working on. And I think one particular story that I know you have about your, the sort of origins of your interest in, in all of this is quite a, mm -hmm. a, a neat connection there. Ooh, so I was actually going to tell you a, a different story because the origin story lasts 68 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, maybe we'll send people to the website for that one. <laughs> and, and in a sense, this story is more interesting and, and sort of subtler. So I began the work that became the Endangered Alphabets in 2009, 2010, and it really got underway with the first exhibition that I did in which I carved Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which says, roughly speaking, all peoples were created alike in dignity and respect. They were endowed with reason and conscience and should act toward one another in a spirit of brotherhood. So I carved that in 12 different minority scripts. And what was interesting to me looking back is that I saw that as an act of documentation. And so the way that I carved them and the way the pieces wound up looking, they look documentary. So by that, what I mean is when you look at the, at the carving, it looks printed. So the carvings sort of looked documentary in the sense that if you look at them, the impression you get is that this is a piece of unfamiliar writing. And later, I would get much more interested in the aesthetics of individual letters or the aesthetics of the wood or whatever. But these are mostly rectangles of wood and there's this unfamiliar writing on them. So as it happened, I then as now have many hats that I wear. And in 2012, I went to Bangladesh and at the time, a friend and I had a nonprofit called Writers Without Borders, which was about teaching writing skills to people in the developing world who are working in healthcare, because essentially all of the world's healthcare issues either begin in the developing world or they're more apparent in the developing world. Mm -hmm. Yet nobody ever listens to what they have to say. And it's impossible for them to get their research or their experiences published in Western journals. So we were running these writing workshops. 
And before I left, I put the word out through social media saying, are there any endangered alphabets in Bangladesh? And I, I got contacted by somebody very, very helpful who said, yes, there are actually two or three and helped me get in touch with some people who could actually, you know, read and write and, and, and speak in these minority languages and could actually write some stuff for me in their scripts. And so I thought, this is great. So I went out to Bangladesh and I got there in the monsoon and that's a whole story in itself. <laughs> and I was fortunate enough to be met in Dhaka, the, the capital, by representatives of three different minority groups or ethnic minorities who were originally from the Chittagong Hill Tracts, which is this upland forested area, sort of in the southeast of the country. And they proceeded to tell me what it was like to be a member of an ethnic minority whose writing and to a certain extent whose language was marginalized or even suppressed. And this was something that I could only have learned at first hand by talking to people who had had that experience. And they were kind enough to write me out short pieces of text that I, I went back to Vermont and I included them in the next carving series that I had done, which was a, a series of four panels, vertical panels, five feet high. And I had composed a poem which went, these are our words shaped by our hands, our tools, our history, lose them and we lose ourselves. And I'd had this translated into a number of different minority scripts, including some of these from Bangladesh. So I did that and, and I photographed the pieces, of course, and I put them up online. And I got an email from somebody called Mong Nu. And he said, I cannot believe what I'm seeing. Here I am halfway around the world from my home. I'm in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I go on your website and I see my language, my writing. This is just uh, amazing to me. I'm so grateful to you for having included it. If you're ever in Cambridge, I would love to meet you, etc. And as it happened, and this is the, the connection part, I was going to be in Cambridge the following week. And so rather than just taking this as a, well, that's nice kind of message, mm -hmm. I arranged to meet him. And we met in a cafe in Harvard Square, and he told me about his life and life in the Chittagong Hill Tracts. And again, this is something that could go on for a long time, but <laughs> in brief, he was a Marma, an ethnic Marma, a member of the Marma people. And he told me about his first day at school. And he had been really looking forward to school. And his mother had been really looking forward to him going to school. And he gets to school and the teacher addresses the class in a language he cannot understand mm -hmm. because Bangladesh has, at the, or especially had at the time, a one language policy, which was, you know, the national language is Bangla and it will do you good to learn to speak the national language. And in any case, we don't really care what you minorities think. You know, this is, mm -hmm. this is what we're all about. And because he couldn't understand what the teacher was saying, his attention wandered. Not surprising, you know, he's <laughs> six years old. And the teacher calls him up to the front and canes him for not paying attention. And then later in the same day, the same thing happens again. The teacher canes him again for not paying attention in a language that he can't speak. And so he went home and the following morning when he was supposed to be going to school, he's just sitting there with tears running down his face. And his mother says, you must go to school. You know, you must get an education. And he explained what had happened. And his mother, even though she believed very strongly in the value of education, decided that this was wrong. And she essentially homeschooled him to the point where he could go to a boarding school, which required him to walk through the jungle and then to take a bus and then a, a river taxi and then another bus, you know, all, all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And 
he did so well at his schooling that he wound up being the first of his people to go to university in America. He went to the University of Hawaii and he did a degree in engineering, I believe. And then he went to University of Southern California and did an MBA. And when I met him, he was at Harvard doing a PhD in multilingual education. He also told me about what it was like in the hill tracks, the fact that the whole area is militarized and closed off to outsiders, especially journalists and human rights workers, and how all of the indigenous people in the hill tracts speak multiple languages. Very frequently, they speak you know, other ethnic minority languages and even use some of their scripts. But their ability to get themselves taken seriously is virtually zero. And so what he was doing was learning how to create a school. He had found a ruined temple and the monk of the temple had a number of kids who were in his care because their parents had been killed by the military, their houses had been burned, but he, he couldn't teach them. And so Mong had decided it was his job to learn how to create a mother tongue curriculum. And so he and I then worked together for several years. And in some respects, we're still working together. And I worked with my students in a publishing class that I'd created at Champlain College in Burlington. And we created all of these learning materials in these minority scripts, because, of course, the government wouldn't provide materials in the scripts for these languages that the kids spoke. And we did alphabet wall charts and we did rubber stamps so the kids could stamp out their letters. And we did coloring books because they'd never seen coloring books and writing journals and storybooks based on folk tales that the kids' grandparents told them. And the reason why it changed everything that I do is important because in the West, we're in the position of being privileged enough that our languages and our alphabet really dominate the world. Mm -hmm. And so it's very hard to have anything other than a kind of intelligent curiosity about how other people do things. And that's really how I had been operating up until then. I thought, wow, this stuff is really interesting. I'm going to carve this and I'm going to carve that. And what this experience did is it made me an activist. It made me someone who realized that the academic notion of studying but not getting involved was a crock because by the time um, somebody else would do something, it would be too late. And that I had to actually get involved in actively supporting and encouraging and promoting and working with these cultures rather than simply being fascinated by these scripts as if the scripts could be divorced from the culture. And that really is and has become the central tenet of everything I do, which is that an endangered alphabet is a symptom of an endangered culture. And to revive an endangered alphabet is to go some small way towards helping revive an endangered people. And in the end, it's the people that are important, not the words. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's one of the things that linguists who do field work are becoming much better about is knowing that you can't just parachute yourself in there, get your data and go home. An important component of studying the language is providing something to the community, and often that's educational materials or, or that sort of thing. Support in their own work that almost every community is trying to do themselves anyway. It's yeah. not a matter of coming in and telling them to do work. It's a matter of coming in and saying, what, how can I help the work I'm sure you're already doing? Yeah, And that in itself has interesting origins and poses interesting problems. Mm -hmm. So it's a central tenet of anthropology, for example, that the biggest mistake you can make is to get involved in the research that you're doing. And well, that you're certainly going to... was one of the central tenets <laughs> yeah, anyway. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And that you're going to impose your own priorities on the situation. That's even in, in Star Trek, you know, it's the prime mm -hmm. directive in Star mm -hmm. Trek. And it's also why in linguistics there has been this move over the last 25 years 
from seeing your main priority as being gaining a technical understanding of the workings of the language Mm -hmm. to such things as, you know, revitalization, which is an extremely new part of the whole field of linguistics. Mm -hmm. Now, as it happens, linguistics also established a set of priorities where writing was a very low priority or actively irrelevant. And Mm. so there is no field of linguistics which is devoted to the cultural importance of writing. Some anthropologists work on that, but not that many. And so when I started work on the alphabets, I assumed that I could read all these books that would tell me all the things that I didn't know, which was everything, and discovered that no, that that didn't exist. And... (laughs) The future of of endangered alphabets, heaven help us, was in my hands. <laughs> that brings me to something that maybe before we go much further is worth talking a little explicitly about, about that relationship between language and script. Because as you say, when your script or alphabet is the default one in so many global spaces, the tendency to equate script and language is pretty strong. In other words, when you're an English speaker, you think of the English language and English writing as being the same thing, even though we call it the Roman alphabet. But of course, it's not. And you're very focused on scripts, obviously. Do you want to say a little bit about like what that relationship, you know, a language is not a script, nor is a script a language. Obviously, they overlap. How do those sort of fit together in your work and in the way you think about them? Yeah. In fact, this is actually such an interesting conceptual problem. Even when I'm talking with my own board, they will say endangered languages when they mean endangered alphabets. Right. And there was an article about minority writing systems that I think the BBC did on their website a number of months ago. And the writer, without realizing he was doing it, used the terms endangered language and endangered writing interchangeably. It's one of the things that I have to do is to actively try and move people's thinking and perception from one to the other. So here's the the relationship. First of all, there are spoken languages that are not endangered, but their script is. So when Indonesia gained independence after World War II, the government decided that, you know, here we are trying to unify 17,000 islands. And in order to do that, what they decided to do was to have one official language, which was really a form of Malay, which they called Indonesian, and one official script. And they decided that as the the Latin or Roman alphabet, as you say, is like the world script, that's the one they would use. So what that meant was that on those islands, the schools pretty much immediately stopped teaching the traditional script and started teaching the the Latin alphabet. Mm -hmm. And so in an island like Bali, for example, they still speak Balinese, but virtually everybody writes it with the Latin alphabet and they would recognize their own script or their own traditional script, but they wouldn't be able to read it. Right. Clearly, there are some cultures where both are endangered and obviously there are some cultures where neither are endangered. But the way that the point that you touch on, which is really, really interesting, is that this leaves those of us in the dominant cultures of the world, not only ignorant about other scripts, but curiously blind to the importance of script. Because the Latin alphabet is, I say that it's like linguistic duct tape to us. You know, you use it for everything. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that in something like three quarters of the countries of the world, it's either the official script or an official script. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is that we don't understand why a script should be important to its culture, because we think of it so kind of universally. And so do the Germans and the French and the Italians, you know. So one of the ways in which I try and bring this to people's attention is the fact that there are many cultures where having their own writing system is so important that individuals have created a writing system specifically for that culture and their language. 
But even more than that, there are cultures that respect and value their own writing system so much that it has a place in their lives, even though they can't read it and write it. So, for example, the Amazir people are also called the Berbers, who once, you know, occupied North Africa from the Canary Islands to Western Egypt, have suffered a series of colonizations by the Romans, by the Arabs, by the French, and to a small degree by the Italians, to the point where they are marginalized in every country where they live. When the Amazir Renaissance began in the 1960s, one of the first things they did was to create an Amazir flag. And the Amazir flag, right in its center, has a letter. It's the letter Yaz. And the reason the letter is there is because the Amazir script, which is called Tifana, has been found on monuments and stones that predate the Romans, that are more than 2,000 years old. And so the letter, simply by being there, is a symbol of the fact that they were there first, and they've been there all along. And in that sense, it's very similar to Cherokee, for example, where most Cherokee cannot read and write the Cherokee syllabary. And yet, if you go to downtown Tahlequah, Oklahoma, the street signs and the road names are in English and in Cherokee. And it's a visual reminder of the fact that, and this is a phrase that that many native groups use in in this country, we are still here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the difference, one of the crucial differences between a language and a script is that the script can act as the visual reminder and embodiment of the fact of a people. Mm -hmm. And that very long, not that oral stuff can't have a long history, of course, but it has that tangible length of time associated with it, at least in some contexts where, as you say, you can can see the physical remnants or not remnants, but the physical existence of a script over a long time in a way that a spoken moment can't. Yeah. Exactly. And and that also ties in with something else, which is that script is given respect and even legal status. Mm-hmm. So one of the reasons why the Abnaki, who are the indigenous people in the area where I live, were denied official status for so long was because they were primarily an oral people, an oral culture people. And so it's like, where is the evidence that you were here 5,000 years ago? And when we say put something down in black and white or have it in writing, we're talking about legal rights, which can include, for example, land rights. And if there isn't that kind of documentation, it's very easy for people to be exploited. And it does say a lot about, I mean, it sends all kinds of messages about the sort of context in which a language is used. You know, for instance, with minority languages, you may still speak it at home with your family. And then you go to schooling in another language. And in the context of the home, the sort of context that you use it in are very casual and there's not a lot of place for writing things Mm -hmm. down. Little need and no pressure on you to do so. Yeah. And so that can send all kinds of messages about the relative importance Mm -hmm. or legitimacy of your home language versus a more official government language or school language or whatever. And that conflation of script and language, which so many people have in their head, Mm -hmm. means essentially, I think, for many people in many contexts, that if you don't have a script, you don't have a language. That in other words, it's just a dialect or it's just a... It's not a real language unless it, I mean, obviously that's not true, of course, in a hundred ways, but I had a friend who I was talking to not that long ago who talked about how her mother's, she can't learn her mother's language because, or she's found it very hard because it does not have a script. It has never had a script. And so learning it in a sort of second language way, because she never properly learned it at home, has become very difficult because Mm -hmm. there's no book, (laughs) you know? Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. And Quite by accident, what I realized was that by carving a piece of text in wood and by sending it to somebody in, you know, the the script slash language place of origin and having them display it, what I was doing was creating something that combined art and signage. 
And mm. both of them had much more power than I had really anticipated. Art has the the power of beauty and also of respect. The idea that somebody has cared about something so much to put so much effort into it is an important kind of embodiment. And signage, as you were saying, has that quality of officialdom. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so if you are a member of a culture that you would never see your writing anywhere official, such as on a wall, um, right then all of a sudden, this becomes a revolutionary gesture. And so one of the first things I did for this mother language school that Hmong had started was to carve Article 1 of, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in one or two of their scripts. And I had assumed that this would go out to the villages and, you know, sort of go up somewhere. But it, it turned out that the... <laughs> The headmaster of the school immediately took it and put it up on the wall of his office. Not that his mm -hmm. office was, you know, particularly grand or, or separated from the rest of the school, as it would be here. But it it became something that was the the only signage in their script, and the right. fact that it was these these kind of noble words gave it this sort of resonance that I certainly hadn't fully understood it would have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I want to just put a quick note in that, of course, none of this is to deny the importance of oracy and all of these things. Like, sure. you know, there are many languages and cultures that have a primacy of orality, and that's very important. And we, you know, one doesn't want to impose literacy on a group that doesn't have it, which I know is not what your work does at all. But just, you know, just to say that, that one should not need a script in order for a language to be an important and, and valuable language and all of those things. But especially if you do already have a script, if, mm -hmm. if you have a script and you've historically had a script, the loss of that script or the dismissal of that script is not important or all of those sorts of things, like, you know, is, is something that really needs to be marked and noticed, I think. Yes, and I'm really glad and, and, and I understand why you corrected yourself from lost to dismissal mm -hmm. or, or lost to dismissal, because there is still a substantial body of thinking that talks in terms of languages dying or scripts mm -hmm. dying or failing. It's like the dodo, right? The dodo did not die out. <laughs> if you look at the descriptions of the dodo, even in, in dictionaries and encyclopedias, it's fascinating how often they talk about it as being a stupid bird. And the impression is that it died out because it was stupid. No, it was it was actually tame. And when people on the island of Mauritius went to kill them, they didn't run away. This is not stupidity. And similarly, when we see languages or scripts that are used by fewer and fewer people and then eventually no people, it's never because either they were somehow inadequate for expressing everything that they needed to express or you know, a script or a language is kind of like a tree which, is, which grows and then just dies, you know, and Going back to the point about revitalization and the challenges it faces, this is almost invariably a political issue because the people whose script or language is not being widely used are invariably being marginalized by a more powerful group or multiple more powerful groups. And if somebody goes into those minority communities and starts working with their language, then there's a very good chance that somebody in authority is going to be annoyed and may even try to prevent them. And this is true, interestingly, also of post-colonial societies. So in West Africa, for example, people tend to be very aware of the colonial history and how it's affected their people. But mm -hmm. it's also quite common for those who are now in charge in this post-colonial time to say, but our children should learn French or should learn English mm -hmm. because- It will give them they... the advantages economically and it will give them political exactly. clout and all of those things. Yeah. And the flip side of that, they will say, if we use our indigenous language or even more our indigenous script, we will look 
backward. We will look mm. primitive. And it was sort of fascinating the first time I was involved in a conversation like that and heard somebody who was actually involved with the Ministry of Education talking about how important it was not to permit minority scripts. Right. And yeah, one of the other big post-colonial forces that I imagine also is involved is, and you mentioned this really with Indonesian, is nationalism, the whole idea of a nation state and the idea of unity and the idea of reflecting unified cultural values and cultural approaches and things. And Bangladesh, you mentioned this as well. A lot of places that have had to carve out new identities in a post-colonial world that encompass multiple nationalities, that encompass many different languages and things. One of the ways that often happens I mean, China is, I know, to bring up something else that I know very much involved with the projects you've been doing, you know, China is a, a very obvious place where that has been an ongoing process as well. Yes, very much so. And in fact, actually, Bangladesh is a, a really good example because so after partition, when British India was divided into India and Pakistan, and mm -hmm. Pakistan, in fact, was divided into West Pakistan and East Pakistan, the assumption was that there would be this kind of unity in Pakistan of religion. Everybody is, of course, Muslim. And there'd be this unity of language, and the official language was Urdu, even though I believe Urdu was spoken by fewer than 10% of the Pakistani population. Right. And of course, you have multiple religions. When East Pakistan demanded the right to speak their own language, which was Bangla, that led to the Pakistan Civil War, and after much bloodshed, the eventual creation of Bangladesh as a sovereign nation. And one of the rallying cries in East Pakistan, which became Bangladesh, was the mother tongue movement, which was a protest movement to be allowed to speak Bangla. So no sooner has Bangladesh become an independent and sovereign nation than the government passes a one language policy rule, which is that mm -hmm. you are not entitled to full citizenship rights unless you're a Bangla speaker. And there are dozens of languages spoken in Bangladesh. And also there are multiple religions practiced. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons why the Hill Tracts became such a point of conflict was precisely because land in that area and political and military and economic decisions in that area were being made by a Bangla speaking Muslim government over the wishes of a dozen or more separate ethnic groups who had multiple languages and religions. And what's more, they were there first. They had been there for centuries and their land was being flooded for a dam and then given away to Bangla settlers. And in part, because the locals had no documentation that they owned the land. They had nothing in writing. Sources, yeah. Right. Circling back a little bit to something that you were talking about and, and the idea of a language and a people being a kind of living, breathing thing. It's one of the reasons I really like the the medium of carving, because on, on the one hand, as you say, the, the sort of effort and time that it takes to produce that says something about its importance and it its, its value. Status and, it gives its yeah, status. And value, yeah. But carving it in wood is a sort of reminder that it is something organic, that it represents human beings, people who have this connection to the script and the language. Yes. And, and in fact, I'm going to take that in a slightly different direction, but it, without contradicting you in the slightest. So one of the things that I still am trying to understand fully and put into words is why people look at the pieces I do, or at least some of the pieces I do, and say, that is beautiful. And in some cases, it's clearly a sense of delight and ownership. So I'll post something, a photograph of a carving I've done on Facebook, and somebody from that community on the other side of the world will say, thank you for respecting or paying attention to or whatever, our beautiful script. 
And that obviously is a particular meaning of the word beautiful with a particular richness of its own. But one of the other things that I find fascinating is that when you use wood, because as you say, it's this extremely organic medium, which is also very sensitive to wind and weather and water and sunlight and local soil, all this kind of thing, then what you see in the grain is a set of patterns which have this extraordinary quality of being regular but not predictable. Mm. And this is particularly true in curly maple, which I use a lot, where in addition to the longitudinal grain, you also have this ripple pattern running at right angles across the grain. And it's really, it's really beautiful in part because, as I say, it has the, the regularity of pattern, of ripple, but it's also not predictable. So it doesn't seem mechanical or, or mathematical. Mm-hmm. And I, I realized at one point fairly early on that as human beings, we are pattern seeking and pattern <laughs> creating animals. Right. And one of the ways in which we recognize danger, for example, is by violation of a predictable pattern. And one of the ways in which we try to impose a sense of of security for ourselves is by creating patterns. And language is a pattern and writing is a pattern. And I did this one carving and it was of a chant, Om and Shanti, Shanti and Om. And it was on a piece of wood that had this unbelievably turbulent grain. And all of a sudden, I had this sense that writing is a pattern that we create, as is chanting for that matter, in order to establish a sense of order within an unpredictable and chaotic universe. And and so therefore, part of our sense of beauty has to do with reassurance, the fact that we have created something that is not entirely chaotic and radical and, and frightening, mm-hmm. but actually implies that we're doing our best to, to create some sense of order and predictability within this existential chaos. That, of course, reminds me of the Greek word for beauty, cosmos. Mm. which literally means order, regularity, beauty. That's what it is. I did not know that. That is yeah. wonderful. Yeah. So hence, of course, the cosmos, which is the order of the universe, as well as cosmetic, the thing you do to make yourself beautiful. <laughs> I yeah. love that. But its most basic meaning is is order, really. Mm. Yeah. And so I think the Greeks would certainly agree. And I, I agree with you. I think I think maybe what we find most beautiful in the world is something that uh, that's a big statement for me to make. I'm just going to ah. I'm just going to rule on <laughs> aesthetics among humans. But sure, I mean, sure. I think one of the things we find beautiful is something where there is a tension between. And that's, I think, what you're talking about, too. A tension between the order and the regularity and the disorder and the tendency towards irregularity everywhere. So, you know, the famous idea of the beauty spot that I said of perfectly regular features is beautiful, but it is most beautiful if there's one irregularity, one mark that blemishes somehow that kind of tension. Right. And different cultures place differing degrees of value Mm -hmm on the order end of things, or you could call it disorder, or you could call it creativity or individuality. Yeah, yeah. Well, and certainly when you're talking about the grain in, in wood, for instance, I mean, that uniqueness that every single piece of wood is going to be slightly different, no matter how similar they are, yeah, uh, is, is part of what we find beautiful about wood. <laughs> you know, one of the reasons we go to such great lengths to get perfectly lovely pieces for a countertop or something like that is because of that combination of order and something else. Yeah. Yes, yes, very much so. Mm-hmm. Earlier, we were talking about how, especially after the mid 20th century, there there was you know this kind of move towards using more standardized global scripts, and and of course, there's a sort of technological pressure there in terms of things like printing, and then again later on with computers. But I wonder, do you think in the very most recent time period, now that we, we have devices with touch screens? 
that that may be a good thing to take advantage of in terms of preserving and reviving endangered texts, because you're no longer tied to a physical keyboard. And so you can have an input that is designed specifically for any script, each individual script. What do you think the role there for that technology might be? So I I have this saying, which is that the internet is always doing two contrary things simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely true that the spread of computing did create this kind of script hegemony, Mm -hmm. uh, which is actually at the heart of things, because even if your display will show different scripts or languages, the coding is done in the Latin alphabet almost exclusively. And the fact that one of the first priorities of a culture that's trying to revitalize its traditional script or create a new one is to get it digitized, that predisposes everybody toward writing with their thumbs, basically, and thinking of writing in terms of, of individual and individualized characters as opposed to, for example, cursive characters. Mm -hmm. So all of that's going in one direction. Going the other direction is the fact that I could never be doing the stuff that I'm doing if it weren't for the internet. And I want to give a plug here now to a guy called Craig Cornelius, who works for Google and has worked with multiple cultures all over the world to help them make their writing systems consistent and adaptable for Android phones and for keyboards. And that means that you have a situation which is extraordinarily radical, where Somebody from a mem- who is a member of a minority culture, let's say who is Somali Bantu. So the Somali Bantu have been repressed by just about everybody everywhere they've been. But, oh, that's not a good example. They don't have their own script. Okay, let's talk about <laughs> the Zagawa people. Okay, so the Zagawa people live on the borders of Sudan and Chad, very desert area. They do a lot of, of camel herding and they, they have a script which was created initially in the 1960s that is actually based on branding marks of camels, which is super appropriate. And they're certainly not a powerful or dominant culture in their region, but somebody can now text in the Berea script to somebody else uh, of the Zagawa people without having to go through the intermediary script of a colonial or or governmental authority. Mm -hmm. And that is, as I say, politically, that's an extraordinarily new and radical idea. Of course, it's an idea that has terrified colonial authorities all along because Mm -hmm. you don't know what they're saying to each other. (laughs) Yeah, Mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the flip side of the uh, wind talker code, the yes, uh, yeah, yeah, yes, know, between the, the the code coding and code mm-hmm. breakers, the use a language that nobody knows, and suddenly your codes are eighty five times better. Yeah, yeah, that that was fine when they were doing it in the service of the government. Mm-hmm. But, exactly, but there'd been three centuries, four centuries, of it being the most subversive thing you could do to speak your own language. Exactly. And, in the same places, yeah. Uh, on that note, Mark reminded me today, this will, for those of you listening, this will not really apply, but Mark reminded me, of course, that it is quite suitable that today we are speaking to you on Indigenous Peoples Day. Here in Canada. So that is an appropriate time to be talking about this. Because I did want to actually ask that, we've talked a lot about sort of colonialism and Indigenous scripts. I imagine that that can be quite a complicated, well, complicated in many ways, but one of the ways in which that may be complicated sometimes is that in some areas, scripts may have initially been a product of colonial involvement. A group comes in and imposes or creates or in some other way leads to the the creation of a script for a language. And then successive historical moves slash new waves of colonial people may render that, you know, by the time that something else has happened, that original colonial imposition has now become integrated into a culture and is now essentially an indigenous and now perhaps oppressed or suppressed or otherwise marginalized script. Does that is that true? Am I making that up or is that something that has happened? No, that that is especially true in Canada, in fact. Yes. 
Yeah, um, that's what I was thinking of to some degree. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. And yes, so for your listeners who don't know this, there was a young Methodist sort of minister in training named James Evans, who emigrated from England and arrived in Canada in the early 19th century and became especially interested in and apparently well accepted by initially the Cree, also later Ojibwe. And it was very common among missionaries to learn the local language mm-hmm. as a means of then reaching the population and, and trying to convert them. And in fact, the largest linguistic organization in the world is in fact a Christian missionary organization that has been learning languages and documenting them very, very widely indeed. What happened with with Evans, which I, th- I think is particularly interesting and makes it sound and possibly be less of an imposed notion, is that when he created the syllabary, it was accepted and taught by the Cree to each other and within their community to an astonishing astonishing degree and and it spread with amazing rapidity so one of the, the the things that is often said about the Cherokee script is that once it had been accepted by the tribal council the Cherokee achieved something astonishing like 80 to 90 percent literacy hmm. within about a decade which may well be the fastest literacy gain rate you know of any people Never. in history and certainly <laughs> yeah. in many in many areas they had a higher rate of literacy than than the European settlers around them mm-hmm. and I don't know the figures for the Cree but I do know that within some extraordinarily short period of time, like six to nine months, it was showing up a thousand miles from its point of origin, wow. which given that travel, I mean, obviously the Cree were a mobile people, but a thousand mm-hmm. miles is, is pretty it's mobile. It's still a thousand miles. <laughs> yeah. And And yes, it came to the point where it did become the form of expression and the embodiment of a minority in a way that was then discouraged. Having said Mm -hmm. that, Evans was discouraged even while he was alive and creating this. In fact, (laughs) the Hudson's Bay Company essentially tried to create trumped up charges against him not what the Hudson's Bay Company, but such a paragon <laughs> um, <laughs> of, of good corporate actors in the world. Yeah, <laughs> right. But, uh, apparently, what really irked the most was that, and this is still true in North America among many native cultures, the exchange of goods was seen as being the communal and respectful way to proceed and to, to mm-hmm. sort of base an economy. Whereas money was not seen as being something that had the same kind of sort of deep communal value or earned mm-hmm. value. And so consequently, the Hudson's Bay Company felt that when First Nations people were exchanging goods, they were actually carrying out illegal trade. <laughs> And so anybody who was supporting or respecting that was automatically working against the Hudson's Bay trade monopoly. And and right. Evans was put into that category. And there were these charges brought up against him that he had been acting improperly as a man of the cloth. And it turned out that what that meant was that if one of the people in the village where he was living was sick, he would take them into his house and make sure that they were like warm, for example, and cared for. That doesn't sound very religious. <laughs> yeah, he was he was hauled up by his church council and examined both in Canada and then subsequently in England. And all of this became so stressful that he wound up dying. Oh. See, that is not a story I know, which I feel quite, well... I'm going to say ashamed by, but I mean, there are many stories in the world I don't know, but that one's one I feel like I ought to have known that. I mean, did I did know about the writing system in a sort of generalized way, but I didn't know its particularity of its history. Yeah, not fun. But in that same way, then when they then went on to establish the residential schools and all the rest of it, of course, even though that had been originally not an indigenous script, I'm sure the loss and suppression, again, a suppression rather than simple loss of it 
was felt just as strongly by the communities as it would have been otherwise. Right. I, I want to put in a plug here for a great organization, I believe based in Nunavut, mm -hmm. called Inhabit Media. Mm -hmm. And the rule of thumb pretty much in Canada is that the closer to the U.S. border you are, the less likely you are to find First Nations people using the syllabics. The further right. north you go, the more likely you are to see the syllabics. Right. which fits in with my theory that endangered alphabets survive best in deserts and in mountains and in jungles and in, in inaccessible you know, places frozen. that yeah, no exactly. one else can come. Yeah. So Inhabit Media is a, a publishing company that turns out these fabulous books based on indigenous tales or even indigenous first person experience. Mm -hmm. And they publish them not only in Inuktitut as a language, but also in the syllabics. Right. And so anybody who's listening, I, I invite them to, to check out the- mm -hmm. We'll put a link to that. I'll, I'll find it. Yeah. I'll put a link in, in the yeah. notes. Yeah. We could just keep talking because I have so many other things that I want to talk to you about. But I want to make sure that we give you an opportunity to talk about some of the actual projects that you do with Endangered Alphabets. We, by the way, have the game. I'm yeah. loose yeah, uh, and have played it and enjoyed it. So I, I don't know if you want to talk about that and about the Alphabets Atlas. And I want to make sure that you give some some time to talk about some of those things. Yeah, so I, I often say that the Endangered Alphabets is like a hedgehog because <laughs> it really sticks out in so many different directions and it touches on so many, not just so many cultures, but so many issues, mm -hmm. so many ideas. So I I will almost certainly run out of voice before I talk about everything that I've tried. <laughs> but yes, so at endangeredalphabets.net, we created, what happened was that I would go out and give talks and, and show the carvings and people would say, this is fascinating. Where can I learn more about about this? Right. And the answer was there isn't anywhere. And so the Atlas of Endangered Alphabets is an online interactive site where you can go to anywhere on the globe and there'll be a pin where anywhere where there's an endangered alphabet, you can click on it and then you can see examples of it, and learn more about it. There's going to be a print edition of the Atlas coming out next year, which I've been oh, working on. Yeah. So that, and, and of course, the Atlas is perennially out of date. Not, I'm glad to say, because endangered alphabets are dying out, but because new scripts are being created for their user communities, which mm. um, we are constantly trying to keep up with. So the game Ulus Legends of the Nomads came about when I heard that the Chinese government had decided as, as part of the policy you were talking about earlier, this kind of homogenization policy, they were going to replace the teaching of the Mongolian language and the use of this unbelievably beautiful Mongolian vertical script with Chinese. And so rather than march across the world in protest on my own and, <laughs> and, and shout abuse at the Chinese government, I, did, I sort of took a lot of advice in and we decided that we were going to create a game, a tabletop game. The idea being twofold. One was to introduce Mongolian culture to the West, where basically Mongols are only ever depicted as bloodthirsty savages, as if the world you know, was still in the year 1200 and we were busy being overrun by them. And, and, and so the game explores the Mongol lands and mythology and heroes and also you know, historically genuine people and works within sort of values of the, the Mongol people. But we also wanted to make it so that in Mongolia and to a lesser degree in China and Russia, there would be this game that would reiterate, shall we say, traditional values at a time when the Mongols in particular are, are sort of torn between their traditional nomadic herding outdoor lives and the kind of citified contemporary existence. So that was that was the game Ulus. I'm also working on a thing called the Red List Project. So mm -hmm. nobody thought about endangered species or even used the phrase until the publication of the Red List of Endangered Species in the 1960s, which really positioned the situation so that instead of kind of going, the dodo is a stupid bird and it's extinct, we would mm -hmm. kind of go, oh, actually, there are only... 12 breeding pairs of osprey left in Scotland. And 
changed all that around. Mm -hmm. So the red list of endangered alphabets is intended to document all of the world's current writing systems and to assess the degree of health or threat that they each face, which is a huge task, not least because it turns out that there are a lot more writing systems than anybody thinks. I had estimated (laughs) threatened or marginalized or actively suppressed. So that's a big project, and it's going to take probably three years. And then, I mean, having worked on on this subject for a decade, I estimated there are about 140. And in fact, there are over 300. Mm -hmm. And of those, at least 90% are to some degree threatened. The one that I am hoping to engage, and by the time you broadcast this, our fundraiser will either have succeeded or failed, is to help the king and the people of Bamum, which is a a kingdom within Cameroon, to revitalize their writing system that was created by their king, King Ibrahim Njoya, about a century ago and was then crushed by the French colonial authorities who did their best to eradicate not only the script, but also the spirit of indigenous and sort of bamumly self-respect and independence that the script had come to represent. So the script now is in the state that Cherokee was maybe 30 years ago, which is that people recognize it and revere it and esteem it, but they can't read it or write it. And we have heard from the palace that they are very, very keen to have us come in and work with them to revive their script, which is obviously going to be a multi-year project. And if any millionaires are listening to this broadcast, (laughs) we need you. But that is, in many ways, that is such a perfect embodiment of the value to a culture of its own script and the threat that that poses to a more powerful culture and the outcome of that threat, namely that it is, it's virtually destroyed. And so if we can help to revitalize that, my hope is that that is going to give impetus to revitalization of scripts everywhere. Right. And maybe a, a model for some of them, you know, you can find out what mechanisms work best or don't or all of that. In the same oh, way that I, revital- I so. language revitalization has been a sort of shifting process. People are figuring out how different models for how to do that. Yeah, I forgot to mention that one of the other things that I want to do is to have a conference, mm-hmm. which we the first conference on script revitalization and new script creation and promotion anywhere in the world. And one of the things that that would do is to start establishing best practices and start to connect both people in communities that are trying to revitalize their scripts with experts in the West who can help, but also do that whole kind of South-South connection between Mm -hmm. individual communities who are facing the same issues and We're hoping to make it easier for them to talk to each other and share best practices and experiences. Mm -hmm. So, okay, how can people, I know that this that's one specific project that you're doing a a specific backing for right now, but how in general, if people are interested, obviously they can go to your website and see the, I mean, we have only touched on, just for the audience, we have only touched on a few of the projects and things that exist there's a you can get carvings you can get books of of images you can get all sorts of things like that but what sort of what ways can people be helpful if they want to yeah so we are appallingly ill-funded and the fact that we're funded at all is largely due to running pretty much once a year a kickstarter campaign so people can watch out for our next Kickstarter campaign. We are now starting to work looking for corporate sponsorship, especially in the language and language services industry. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have just launched a Patreon. So that's another thing that people might find interesting because I'm going to be, as as one of the, the Patreon benefits, I'm creating videos that show exactly what I do with these pieces of wood and how they wind up the way they are and all the various misfortunes that happen along the way. And I'm delighted that we're also regularly contacted by people who want to volunteer for us and offer their their skills 
skills or their services or their time. So all of those would be possibilities and all of those really go through the endangeredalphabets.com website. Yeah, there are so many different, I would imagine there are so many different areas of expertise or interest, mm-hmm. given that you cover so many different areas of the world and so many different <laughs> languages and so many, you know, all of these things that if anyone is at all interested, I'm certain there's ways for you to be, to be involved and to be helpful. So reach out to Tim if you can. Then I know that you're also on Twitter. Can you just remind me of your handle? Yes, I'm on Twitter at Endangered Alpha. Mm-hmm. Instagram at endangered alphas. And we just started a, I've been on Facebook for a while, but we've just started a Facebook group that is specifically an endangered alphabets Facebook group. And I have a relatively modest presence on LinkedIn. Oh, great. So I'll post all of those things in the show notes. And I urge everyone to, at the very least, go and look at the absolutely beautiful things, speaking of beauty, mm-hmm. <laughs> that- that Tim makes and the uh, the work that's being done. And we enjoyed the game. I think that yeah. if you're a tabletop mm-hmm. gamer and you are looking for something interesting and different, this is definitely one. Plus the work of trying to figure out what is a camel and what is a goat on the bones <laughs> <laughs> will help keep your mind sharp. <laughs> yeah. yes. Yes. And a horse or whatever. I yeah. can't remember the four of them. <laughs> Well, just speaking of another thing, I gather there's a, an endangered alphabet Sudoku in the works. Oh, my mother um, will be so excited by that. <laughs> so we have a, a book of endangered alphabets word search puzzles. Mm-hmm. And yeah, endangered alphabet Sudoku. We've already done individual ones. And knowing me, there's likely to be a, a book of some kind coming. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This is like Again, there are so many other things I could have asked you or we could have talked about because this is such a fascinating area. And I imagine it's very fractal. The more you look at it, the more there is to look at. The the farther in you get, the the farther in you need to get. But thank you so much for, for coming and talking to us today. I am I am so glad that you invited me and you asked such great questions. And not only did you make really good observations, I wrote down a number of the observations you made. So. <laughs> well, I'm glad if we can be useful, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so the best conversations are productive for both sides. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you so much and good luck with the fundraising. It's and I hope that process. you are able to, yeah, it's to over. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it will still be applicable when yep. this comes out. But I hope that this particular project, which sounds really, 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 really valuable mm-hmm. and, and and important, manages to get to get going. So good Wonderful. luck. Thank you. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.